Okay, welcome back to, to um, um, Introduction to Genomics. Uh, today's lecture, we're going to talk about something a little bit different, which is the, the application of genomic principles to thinking about, in particular, gene expression regulation in living organisms. And so a lot of what we, um, what we do in genomics and a lot of methods are really well tailored for looking at things like cell lines and, and sort of in vitro situations. Um, but today we'll talk about how how we can actually get at what's happening inside of living organisms. And so just as a reminder, um, <clears throat> animals in particular and other multicellular organisms have this incredible diversity of, of cell types inside of them. And so you know, we have, you know, for example, in this figure, there's some fibroblasts, some endothelial cells, neuron, different types of blood cells. And each of those different cell types comes about because those cells express different parts of the genome. And so the gene expression and differences in gene expression across cell type are really fundamental to understanding how um, different cells' physiology is established. All right, so we'll talk briefly about some of the methods, sort of traditional methods, for measuring gene expression differences between cells, populations, organisms, conditions, what have you. All right, so. You know, people are <clears throat> spend a lot of energy thinking about microarray methods or RNA seq. More recently, <clears throat> mass spec, which will come out later in the course, um, as ways to take sort of a large sample and grind it up and look at which genes are expressed in 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 that sample. Now that's great, but it has pretty um, limited spatial resolution unless you go to really extreme lengths. So certainly, that we'll, we'll talk about single single cell methods for these kind of approaches, but they have Severe, pretty, pretty substantial limitations as well, and they're pretty cumbersome. Um, sort of in, in contrast, there's you know methods like like antibody staining or um, RNA fish in situ hybridization to recognize individual transcripts, and those um, those methods are, have sort of the reverse set of advantages and disadvantages. So they have um, <clears throat> they have um, incredible spatial resolution. You can really look across, you know, whole tissue sections or in some cases whole organisms and figure out where exactly in those organisms is your gene expressed. But they require specific affinity reagents which can be expensive and they're you know, certainly not ultra high throughput. And then sort of a third approach is to use um, reporter genes. And so we can look at transcriptional reporters where you have the promoter of a particular gene um, driving, for example, green fluorescent protein, or the same kind of situation with the translational reporter, where you actually have the, the protein itself fused to GFP, and you can look at subcellular localization. And but these, again, they're, they're somewhat cumbersome. They require that you actually generate the transgene, get it into the organism that you're studying. And so, in terms of an in vivo assay, these are pretty much limited to model organisms. Obviously, you can't make transgenic humans to study where a human gene is expressed. And then we're not going to talk a lot about. Um, today, but just sort of for completeness, you can also use small molecules. And so, um, you know, a classic example of this would be a fluorescently labeled phloidin, which can, can um, give you um, targeting of particular types of muscle cells. All right, so, so actually generating transgenic strains that express, for example, a promoter driving green fluorescent protein um, really is, is uh, you know, vastly different in terms of its cost efficiency f between organisms. And so sort of at one extreme, you have, you know, bacteria, yeast, um, tissue culture cell lines sort of fall in the same category where it's very, very inexpensive to generate a particular um, transgenic organism, and you can do it on a huge scale. So you can, you know, get 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th individuals, each express, each carrying a different transgene, you can, which allows you to do specific kinds of library kinds of assays, which I'll talk about briefly. You know, and then the other end of the extreme, you know, you start looking at actual animal models, for example, something like fish, Fly, where you know you actually have to go and do something specific. For example, for flies, you know you would use an injection apparatus to inject your DNA into oocytes. For worms, you might do something similar with injection, or you or go in with um, um, with a microparticle bombardment. But either way, you're talking about hundreds to you know in the case of mouse, maybe thousands of dollars per animal or per, per um, strain expressing a particular transgene. And so the types of experiments you can do are much more limited. So, um, so just briefly to talk about how you can generate large quantities of reporter constructs. If you're going to really look at sort of a genome scale or sort of, um, you know, more generally in high throughput at different kind of reporter constructs, you need, need to have a way of generating those reporter constructs um, at, at, with, um, with high efficiency. And so, 
So sort of three of the most, most I mean, certainly you can use traditional cloning methods and where you, you know, you say PCR up a particular region and you use restriction enzymes to cut the ends and clone it into your plasmid. Um, but these three approaches, gateway cloning, fusion PCR, and recombineering, have really um, you know, begun to take over from those methods for, from traditional cloning methods for large-scale um, approaches. Right, and so, so these have different fundamental principles behind them, but so basically, for example, gateway cloning involves taking your gene, PCR up your gene that you want to make a reporter for, and you p use PCR primers that have these different um, specific ends on the end that, that are recognized by a particular recombinase, um, which then you can recombine with a, with a um, uh, um, plasma that has the, the cognate um, recombination sites, and basically this, this recombination reaction sort of um, replaces this, this CCDB, which is a counter-selectable marker with your gene of interest. Um, Recombinating actually has a similar kind of approach where you have these um, homology arms. In this case, instead of being sequences that um, are recognized by a particular recombinase, instead these are sequences that are homologous with your target plasmid, and you use this lambda, lambda red system, which basically in bacteria it causes your, um, your um, PCR product to recombine with the target vector and give you a, a fusion where your, your gene is now inserted at a site-specific way into that, into that plasma. Um, and then fusion PCR, which has been used yeah. most notably in worms, but in other species as well, basically you can PCR up, for example, your gene of interest and then also GFP, and you PCR them in a way that you have um, um, a little tail on the end of your primer that's homologous with, um, with the, the other PCR product, combine those in a tube. Um, with each other and just use the outside primers, this one and this one, and what will sp specifically amplify in that case is the hybrid where you have now your gene fused to GFP. And so if you don't need to actually clone anything, you, it's having just a linear DNA molecule is enough, then that works pretty well. All right, so what can you do in the case of these microbial systems where you have, can generate these really high complexity libraries of um, different transgenes? And so one thing you can do is a screen. So you can say, what happens if we express each individual gene? Does that cause a fitness defect? Um, so this has been done, for example, in yeast. You can ex overexpress all the different genes, and you can see, well, these ones are especially detrimental when they're overexpressed. Perhaps their dose is going to be something that's especially important for phys physiology. It could be stoichiom stoichiometry or other reasons. Um, so another kind of experiment you can do is to transform many constructs. Um, so, for example, people made, um, um, I mentioned here, the um, fusion reporters for all genes in yeast. You can, um, <clears throat> you can, make, you can do this really for, for any species. So that actually we recently published a paper with uh, collaborators in Germany that they generated um, GFP fusion reporter constructs for every gene, or essentially every gene in C. elegans. And that, um, now that provides a library that, that researchers can introduce into, um, into worms. Okay, so, so one of the cool things that's been done recently, both with cell lines and in, in microbial systems, and um, in this particular example is in E. coli, is to um, really systematically mutagenize regulatory regions and determine which aspects of the sequence is important. So this is just a quick summary of the lactose pathway. So just, um, if you remember correctly, then, then the lac um, operon, which, which allows the cells to metabolize lactose, is normally kept repressed by this lac I protein, which binds to the lac operator. In the presence of lactose, then that repression is relieved. But then there's a second pathway where you actually don't express lactose unless you also have low levels of glucose, because it turns out it's more efficient to grow in glucose than in lactose. Okay, so if you look at, um, <clears throat> and so in the absence of the LAC inhibitor, LAC I protein, you basically have two major components regulating the expression of this gene, the RNA polymerase and this um, CRP, which is the, the um, responder to the glucose concentration. And so what this, um, they did in the study by Kinney et al. Um, was to take this sequence that responds to, um, the, which is the lactose promoter, and it's about 75 bases long, and they did a high, high throughput mutagenesis of the sequence. And so uh, roughly 10, 15 percent, um, so every individual um, DNA sequence has about 10 mutations in it. And 
Then they cloned all of those as a library into a, into a reporter, a GFP reporter in this case. And then they grew up the cells. And so some of the cells had, had one mutation, other cells had another mutation. So that within that population of cells, they had all possible mutations. And in fact, they had all possible pairs of mutations in that, com in that, um, in that population. And then they used a, a, a cell sorter to pull out cells that had high expression, medium expression, low expression. And that gave us then, by sequencing the, the um, DNA sequences that led to each of those expression levels, they were able then to get this data set where they had essentially the relationship between expression output and, and sequence. Uh, and what that then gave them is these sort of cool footprints, right? So you have, um, now this is just the whole sequence laid out here um, in, in nucleotides, and you can see there's these footprints, and those are basically high information content sites where you have um, mutations and those have a strong effect on, on gene expression. And so, um, and this is just in two different scales, and so you can see basically in this case, since we know the biology pretty well for LAC, we know where the CRP and RNA polymerase are contacting the DNA, and those sites are exactly the spots that are, that are highly conserved in this, in this regulatory assay. Um, and then this is just if in the situation where, where CRP is not relevant, then you can repeat the experiment, and now you only see the binding, binding sites for the RNA polymerase. Okay, so that's great. And then more recently, this has actually been, been, this kind of approach has been adapted to a number of different cell types. It's been done in vivo in mouse liver. It turns out in liver in mouse, you can inject um, your transgene into the um, tail vein of the mouse. It'll go in, and you'll actually get um, different hepatocytes taking up different DNA molecules, and you can use essentially the same strategy, but in vivo in the mouse liver. Um, it's been done in, in a couple different human cell um, type situations for different enhancers. Um, and it's been done um, um, in yeast by actually, and I should say you don't have to do this by mutagenic PCR, which is the way the original bacterial LAC paper was done, but you can also do it by, by actually t specifically designing an optimal set of oligonucleotides um, using microarrays based synthesis. So you can basically synthesize you know, a couple hundred thousand unique, um, say, 70 mer DNA sequences, clone those in, and now you know exactly what is in your pool. Right, so you can get these same kinds of footprinting information that we saw with the LAC situation where you identify the factor binding sites. You can also distinguish different models of site spacing. Some sites you might imagine it's important that transcription factor 1, transcription factor 2 bind right next to each other. Maybe they have an interaction, and if you separate them by, say, five nucleotides, and they'll be on opposite strands or opposite sides of the DNA helix, then they won't be able to act anymore. So you can determine that kind of thing as well. And then one of the um, studies in particular was especially good at distinguishing activity. So it turned out that the, the, the most active promoter sequence actually was not as inducible as, the, as some of the least, less active sequences. So it's important to think about what, act, what the actual biologically relevant activity is. All right, so this, um, <clears throat> there's been a whole series of, of studies that have attempted to look at the gene expression of, you know, most or all genes in different organisms. And so one of the pioneering ones was in yeast. There were two papers in Nature in 2003 where they tagged every gene in yeast. And yeast has this handy homologous recombination system, which lets you basically skip all the cloning. You can just PCR up your GFP fusion, or in this case, this TAP, which is a, a tandem affinity purification tag. And you can recombine those, um, those sequences right at the, at the um, um, three prime end of your open re reading frame for a particular gene, and then to see what happens, which, you know, where is GFP expressed in those cells? You know, and by doing that, they were able to actually observe that the majority of the genes in yeast were, in fact, expressed under the conditions that they looked at, looked, like, looked at, and they were able to distinguish where in the cells as well. Some of them were nuclear, obviously, some of them were cytoplasmic, and there was a whole range, you know, they could say, identify mitochondrial or spindle, et cetera, et cetera, localization. So this is very useful, obviously, if you, you know, the first thing you want to do if you find a new gene is figure out where is it expressed and where is it localized within the cell. And this, and this resource has really been used widely within the community for lots of other studies. Um, one of the things that came out of it, which is, um, I think, especially interesting, is, is sort of early studies of noise. This will come up again when we talk about single molecule um, um, genomics. But um, basically, if you take, you can make a strain now that has, instead of having a particular gene fused to GFP, you can have two copies of that gene, one fused to, say, yellow fluorescent protein, the other fused to cyan fluorescent protein. And then you can run that population of cells. Now all the cells are the same through a cell sorter. And what you can see is that um, there's these two, um, there's the spread, right? So 
some cells have really high CFP, some have low YFP, and it tends to be that the cells that have high CFP also have high YFP. So there's this, this concept of intrinsic versus extrinsic noise. And so this extrinsic noise, that's the fact that they both sort of vary together, and that could be thing, caused by things like um, upstream transcription factors that regulate this gene varying cell cycle, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's also intrinsic no noise, which is this direction, and that, um, you know, be the sort of independent variability of, of the CFP versus the YFP um, reporter for the same gene. And that, the existence of that kind of noise suggests there could be some kind of stochastic effects, um, different loci effects, I'm printing, et cetera, et cetera. All right, and so how is this noise controlled? And this was, was really um, nicely um, um, sort of laid out in some, some early papers, again, from Aaron O'Shea and others, um, that um, there's and you can imagine that certain, certain genes, it may be okay if you have a lot of variability and sort of noise in this gene expression. In other genes, it actually may be important to keep it really well controlled. And so you see certain situations of this in, in genomes where you have, for example, um, you know, things like the transcription and translation, right? So it turns out if you have a small number of mRNAs and you make a lot of proteins off of those, you get more noise at the protein level than if you have a, a large number of mRNA molecules and a small number of proteins coming off of each one. Um, Similarly, a lot of noise seems to be coming from interplay between different chromatin states. So you can imagine you have an off chromatin state where nothing is happening, and then an on chromatin state where you're turning out some mRNAs. And if those states are interchanging more frequently, then you're going to have less noise than if they're more stable. Um, this one is one of my, my favorites, where you have, if you have a bunch of different copies of a particular gene, you're going to have less noise overall than if you have say, just two copies. And so you see, for example, in segmental duplications or the paralogs could in part be, be due to this kind of mechanism. Um, and then um, um, the last thing is that you can actually have feedback control. And so, so if a gene is able to regulate its own abundance, you can actually get tighter control of noise than you get just by chance. All right, so for the rest of, the, of this lecture, we're going to talk about specifically developmentally dynamic expression in animals. And this slide just serves the purpose to show that there's this incredibly wide range of, of, of expression patterns that occur in developing animals. This is just a, a small snapshot of the, some of the different expression patterns that have been observed in Drosophila, where you know, the dark staining is the expression of a, of a particular gene, and each of the panels is a different gene. You can see the incredible stripe patterns and puncti and, and different organs forming, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do the same thing in mouse. This has been done to, to a lesser um, scale, but there certainly are labs that have been doing high throughput um, analysis of expression pattern by in C2 and also by reporter um, analysis in mouse. And we're going to talk quite a fair amount about worms, which is my area of expertise, but um, they have particular advantages that we'll get to in terms of their invariant lineage and cell complement. So even though they have many fewer cells, you can see actually in this image, this is a whole worm embryo where you can see the individual cells. You can actually figure out exactly what each of those cells are and what, what other genes are expressed in those cells. And why do this? So uh, I guess the key thing is that if you... Um, if you know where a gene is expressed, that gives you some clues about what it could be doing and also how it could be regulated. And so this is sort of a classic example. These are the, the Eve and Fitz um, genes, which are parule genes in Drosophila. And, and these are really responsible for establishing the segmented, um, segmented body plan that's being set up during, during embryogenesis. And, and just by looking at these expression patterns, you can, see, you can infer that they must have something to do with, with um, segmentation, given the stripey patterns. Okay, so, so just to summarize the large-scale maps that have been collected, um, there's, they've been, really been collected for a wide range of organisms. So um, I showed you some pictures from the fly study, and we'll go into that in more detail, and the worm study that I'll talk about, uh, mouse as well. And the, they've used both in situ hybridization methods, so these are cases where you're actually looking at a particular mRNA that's, um, we, you know, we've gone in with an antisense probe that hybridizes to those messenger RNAs but also by antibody staining in some cases, and most notably in Drosophila, um, and by making re reporters either GFP fusions or LAC, um, LACC kind of um, reporters. And again, you have to come up with ways that you can introduce those into the organism in high throughput. Um, and so how, the question becomes, how do you interpret? You know, you click these images with these beautiful patterns, but how do you tell how they're related? And so um, you know, one, one way is, you know, you can look at the morphology of the embryo to see if you have two embryos of the same stage. You can look for whether the staining for a couple different genes overlaps. 
you can um, go in with landmarks. And so one, um, one method that's been popular is to label, say, a particular gene's expression in one color and then have a, 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 another gene where you know exactly which cells that gene is expressed in and labeled in another color. And you can use that sort of to align expression patterns to each other. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about lineage relationships again in the case of the worm especially. All right, so, so the, really the pioneer in this field was the Berkeley Drosophila um, Genome Project, which started doing in situ hybridization in 96 well plates um, for, for Drosophila fairly early on, published in these, these two seminal papers in genobiology. And here's some some sort of examples of, and I wanted to make the point that, that for example, for this giant um, gene, it's important that you look at dynamics, right? So, so this is an in-situ hybridization of, of this gene at stage 6, and if you look a little bit later at stage 10, the pattern is very different, right? And here's some other you know, engrailed now, I guess, gene at, at stage 10, and it again has a very different pattern. And so you have to find some way to combine not just the, the spatial patterns, but also the temporal patterns, and the expression at one stage may not be the same as the expression at another stage, in fact, often is not. All right, so how do we analyze a data set like this? And in the case of the, the, the Drosophila group, you know, you have thousands of different gene expression patterns for different genes and, different, and then also across different stages. And if a human goes in and looks at, for example, these two expression patterns, they have to actually write down words that describe where the expression is. And so, say I'm not very sophisticated looking at Drosophila, and I say, well, uh, maybe that's the brain of the fly, and so I'll call this two spots in the brain. And my, um, my course co-director, John Hoganish, he's a real whiz with fly anatomy, and he says, oh, this is in the procephalic region. It's in the ventral and dorsal ectoderm, and, and he writes that down. And so the result of that, if we try to um, um, compare, is there's no overlap. So how do we deal with this? Because it turns out that maybe these two genes actually do overlap in this set of cells. So can we find some common way of describing those cells? And so sort of a, a good solution for this is something called a controlled vocabulary, which actually comes up in a lot of, a lot of other genomics contexts, for example, the gene ontology, um, um, which, is, um, which is to def define specific names for all the different parts that exist in the fly. And now I can't call it two spots in the brain. I have to give it a specific... Um, specific names, and now I have to spend a little bit more time learning before I'm allowed to annotate um, the fly images, but now I can get it right, and I can say this is the procephalic ectoderm A. And now um, when a computer goes and looks at this, they can say, oh, look, there's a match. These, these two genes, in fact, overlap in their expression in this particular region, which is better than it could have done before. And so this kind of controlled vocabulary has been generated for lots of different um, organisms again. So I just shown sort of three different examples of this. This is the, um, the anatomy ontology for the developing mouse brain, where you have um, things like the secondary prosencephalon and the rostral secondary prosencephalon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is the, there's the, um, uh, the Berkeley case. So this, this is the one I was just showing you with the prosephalic ectoderm primordium. Um, and then, the, and this is an example for worms. So you know, worm, again, has these specific um, de um, advantages in terms of the invariance of its anatomy as well. But um, again, there are specific names for each cell that, that are used as, um, as part of this anatomy ontology. So this is all well and good, but still, you're, dealing, you're relying on human curators to d annotate the gene expression patterns, and so it would be better if you go in with an automated method. And so this is a method that was um, developed to use those same Berkeley images and now to, to try to align them automatically. And so um, what those Erwin Fries and, and, collab and um, colleagues did is basically overlay upon the embryos a mesh. And so you can basically, the issue is that a Drosophila embryo and another Drosophila embryo they can vary by 50% in the number of cells. Some are bigger, some are smaller. So you have to figure out how do you align those, those in an intelligible way. So they generated this, this mesh that based on the overall exterior shape of the embryo. And then they sort of space warped the entire embryo to fit onto a common reference framework. So down at the bottom, each of these expression patterns have now been mapped onto a, a framework that's exactly the same size and shape. And once they've done that, they can again go and um, um, compare now for these thousands of genes how, how similar are different regions of the embryo and identify and this top um, panel is actually particular um, um, each individual color labels a particular region of the embryo as defined by a, sort of a unique pattern of gene expression which actually corresponds quite well to um, 
to the pattern of, uh, of embryonic regions that was generated by, by decades of experimental work. All right, so one more step for Drosophila to make it even higher resolution because actually, you know, despite the, you know, the power of these kind of automated alignment methods, they're not at single cell resolution. You really like to know it cell by cell, you know, is the same cell in this embryo expressing this gene that's expressing that other gene in the second embryo. Okay, and so another group at Berkeley has, has developed methods to try and get at this. And so basically the strategy is, um, which I alluded to before, was, is to go in, now here's four different genes. We have, what, Knurps, Hunchback, Krupal, and Giant. And those are la labeled, labeled in, in different colors. And in red, you have, um, in this case, um, e, probably Eve, as a marker for the, the boundaries of the different segments. And once you have those Eve stripes, you can then do it now not at the level of, of the whole embryo, but actually at the level of cell by cell, trying to cell, assign each cell to a position in sort of a reference embryo and align the expression patterns. So this lets you get, you know, even though it'll, it'll actually make an alignment at single cell resolution, although in practice the resolution is probably, you know, a cell, more like a couple of cells because you have some ambiguity in which, um, in the, because in, individual embryos don't necessarily have the same number of cells. But still, this is extremely powerful and it's been then used to map expression of, of over 100 different regulators, key embryonic regulators at this stage. Okay, so we're going to switch now to some of the methods that have been used in, in worms, which is my favorite organism. And these are some early in situ pictures in worms. And so one of the, the advantages of the worms is, is they have this invariant anatomy and lineage that I'm going to describe. But one of the disadvantages for this kind of a project is they're really small. And so the kind of in situ hybridization images you can get, they're just you know, sort of fundamentally limited if you use this sort of traditional um, enzymatic labeling kind of approaches. And so you know, you can tell if you're a worm anatomy expert that this, this particular expression here is in the pharynx, but some of these patterns in these embryos, like what are those cells? You can't even really tell where one cell ends and the next cell begins. Right, so, so one solution that's been, that's been done is to look at post-embryonic worms is to actually just do the same kind of automated alignment that I just described for Drosophila. So you can take a, an image of, uh, for, for in this case, an L1 larval worm, and you can computationally straighten it out so you get a nice, um, even um, worm um, shape. And then you can identify all the nuclei in there. They're labeled with a DAPI. And they have, again, landmarks in here. In this case, all the muscle cells are labeled with, with um, green fluorescent protein. And they can use those green muscle nuclei to align all the other cells, um, sort of as landmarks. And then if they have a, a red fluorescent protein reporter for a particular genes expression, they can then look at the expression across all the different cells. And they did this for, again, almost 100 different genes, mostly transcription factors. And they were able to get, for really all of the major tissues except for the, the, the um, nerve ring, which is sort of the brain of the worm, which is sort of still too hard to resolve with this um, kind of microscopy. Um, they were able to get the expression of all these genes across those um, those um, um, cells. Um, this is the um, I wanted, didn't want to leave out mouse and human, so the Allen Brain Atlas is sort of one of the the largest scale efforts of any kind in this in this field. And what they've done originally just with with mouse brain is to slice up individual brains and do in situ in mouse. In the case of mouse, for all of the genes in the mouse. Um, so you can actually go to the Allen Brain Atlas website. They have a beautiful brain explorer where you can actually navigate through um, these images of the brain, search for genes that are co-expressed in particular regions. And they've actually been doing this. They've um, come across um, some human brains as well and been able to do this uh, sort of a similar but more targeted kind of approach on, on human brain as well. And so this is really sort of provided an incredible resource on where genes are expressed across the brain. But you still have the same issue that if you have two genes that are, say, expressed in, um, say, in this, this particular region down here, you can't tell if they're expressed in the same cells in that region or if they're exp expressed in different cells in that region. And so that, that's sort of an ongoing challenge in these kind of approaches. Oh, here's the, this, this is just a picture of the, of the Allen um, Brain Explorer. You can, if you bring this thing up live on your computer, you can actually identify particular regions or even our expression of particular genes and how they relate to different regions of the brain and are co-expressed, which is pretty cool. Again, they use, they use similar sort of landmark-based alignment methods.
Okay, so for the last little bit of the lecture, we'll talk about um, the C. elegans lineage specifically, and um, you know, put up an Im an, a movie here of a developing C. elegans embryo, which hopefully will run. And um, um, I wanted to make the point that there it goes. Um, yeah, so this is a developing C. elegans embryo. This thing is tiny; it's about 30 by 50 microns, and it develops from a fertilized egg to a hatched L1 worm of the kind we saw before, in about 14 hours, depending on the temperature. And what's especially um, notable about it is it has this um, invariant lineage. And so this thing down at the bottom is the pattern of cell divisions from the fertilized egg through that hatched worm, um, with the red line showing you um, where the embryo actually starts to move around in the eggshell. And so, and I can, if I can, yeah, let that continue going so you can see it moving around in the eggshell. So this thing actually hatch and become a worm swimming around the plate eventually. Um, and so we can actually follow the, um, the cell lineage, looking at which cell divides and becomes which other, which cell types, and it's exactly the same from embryo to embryo. There's always going to be 671 cells born, 113 of those are going to die, and 558 will be present in the, in the hatched worm, and you know based on the pattern of cell divisions, exactly what a cell is going to become, whether it's going to become intestine or muscle or neuron, for example. Um, and, and this is just emphasizing the point that if you have um, the lineage history of a cell, you know its faith. And so, for example, if you look at the most anterior cells over here, it's the, sort of the anterior um, daughter of the anterior daughter of the left daughter of the anterior daughter of the, of the zygote, that cell makes primarily neurons, whereas you know, if some other cell in the lineage, it always, that cell is always going to make primarily intestines. You can really have this one-to-one -one mapping between lineage and fate. Um, right, so this is, you might say this is sort of weird. You know, why should we study worms at all if they have such an odd development? But the, the really cool um, sort of side benefit is that they actually have fairly highly conserved regulatory pathways. And so if you know which genes are, for example, important in specifying muscle identity in humans, it turns out there's homologs of those in worms that are important for specifying muscle, muscle identity in worms. And so by understanding cell fate in worms, there's actually a good chance of understanding a lot about humans as well. Right, so, so we um, developed now about um, six years ago methods to trace um, that lineage automatically, and this is just a movie now where every cell is expressing a green fluorescent protein, um, and some of the cells are now have a reporter for a particular gene. In this case, it's a fa 4 which um, is important for foregut development in worms, and its homolog in humans is also important for foregut development. Um, Right, so we can take one of these movies, we can identify all the nuclei in each time point, um, also measure the expression level in each of those nuclei, and we can generate one of these lineage trees. Now this is a lineage tree that's not the canonical lineage tree that I showed you before, but this is actually from the embryo that we looked at. And what's remarkable after doing this now for, you know, we've done this for you know, hundreds or if not thousands of embryos, is it really does always turn out exactly the same, you get the same lineage out. And if you look at the expression of a, of a particular gene, it comes out the same as well. Right, so we, d we did this now for, for you know, close to 150 different genes that we've got this kind of um, lineage-based expression data set for. And again, if you, you can, the beauty of it is you get expression of these 127 different genes, and you can actually align those expression patterns at single cell resolution to figure out which cells co-express which combinations of these genes. And since we focused on transcription factors, we think we have some good candidates about who, which factors may be regulating particular um, cell, cell lineage and cell and tissue identities. Um, right, so, so this is just emphasizing that we can go from this large collection of embryos down to sort of a um, traditional gene expression map where we now have across the top axis all of the different cells in the worm and expression of these 127 different genes on the, on the y-axis and we can break them into clusters, identify combinations of genes that are co-expressed in intestine or pharynx or neuron or particular interesting lineage-specific patterns as well. So one of the um, cool things that's, that, we've, that came out of this was um, was how many genes were actually expressed in lineage-specific patterns, not fate-specific patterns. And this is just sort of a quick example of that kind of pattern where you have these sort of repetitive um, patterns. You can see that um, each of these different genes, the cell that decides to express the reporter is on sort of the right side of one of these division branches. And so um, it turns out that that corresponds to the posterior daughter of each division.
And so these are a bunch of genes that are expressed in a bunch of different posterior de um, derived lineages. And it turns out they, those don't correspond well to um, any particular tissue identity. So the cells that express each of these could give rise, for example, to neurons, pharynx, um, muscle, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and what's interesting is, uh, in many cases, the human homologs for these are also import important for the specification of many distinct um, tissue types. So we think we have a good model here to study how the same transcription factor can be involved in multiple different processes. And sort of when you combine all these things, the bottom line is, you know, essentially every cell in C. elegans is distinct from every other cell at the level of gene expression. Just looking at these 127 genes, you, you look even at, say, closely related um, muscle cells. And this is just a heat map showing all cells by all cells with a, with a color showing you how many genes are differentially expressed between that pair of cells. And you know, other than this really thin diagonal, you know, even two nearby muscle cells derived from the same lineage will have sometimes many different genes that are differentially expressed between them. Why? Who knows? Okay, so um, that's the, we come to the end of this lecture and just wanted to throw out um, some sort of provocative questions about um, where the single cell imaging, in vivo imaging field might um, need to go. And one, one of the questions that I think is really critical is we've got so much information it's clear, I think, from what we talked about today, that you can get a lot of information about um, gene expression patterns, RNA levels, protein levels um, in vivo. It may not be as high throughput as you can get, say, by RNA-seq. But, um, but if you take some of the other kinds of, of experiments we can do, for example, CHIP-seq to look at transcription factor binding sites, you know, how can we look at really how that kind of phenomenon varies from cell to cell within an organism? And, and that's a, a major, major research question, which a number of groups are working on and hopefully will be um, addressed fairly soon. Um, and when we talked about noise, so how, um, how is, um, is noise either used or controlled during, during development to make sure that you have the appropriate degree of robustness and, and um, diversity in cell phase specification? And then really how can we scale up these experiments to go from you know, hundreds to thousands of genes to really full genome scale um, data sets on the uh, dynamic um, time scale that covers the full development of organisms? All right, thanks.